Okay, guys, okay, guys we, are, we live. are live. We were muted, we were muted there, there for a second. Uh, um, I'm just I'm just doing an Ask Me Anything, anything YouTube, YouTube Live because it's, it's been a while, while since I've done one. And, uh, and uh, I think these, I think are, these good are good from time to time. time. I know we've got a lot of people in our online courses that have questions about different training stuff, so on and so forth. If you haven't seen our online courses, check those out at shieldk9online.com. And, and uh, uh, you know, we have a full range of training, training, training courses, courses, everything from protection, protection training, training and competition obedience to pet dog training, training, training and so much, so much more. We hear your, we hear your voice double. double. Oh, oh, great. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's figure, figure out, out why. How about now? Ah, I bet I know what it is. There it is. It was my... See, this is why we have these kind of breaking it in podcasts here. So, not podcasts, I should say. It's a live how about that? Am I still echoing? Am I still echoing? All right, good. Yeah, I was just um, my webcam apparently has a mic that I forgot to turn off, so we were uh, <clears throat> we were getting some some echo. Anyways, guys, this is going to be an Ask Me Anything. I'm just kind of getting my new equipment here in my new uh, office all figured out so this is going to be kind of just like a, a break everything in type deal so we're gonna go for it okay so i see you guys all coming on here again i didn't announce this live i'm gonna get better at announcing lives ahead of time i didn't announce this live because i didn't know if i was gonna do a live or not today until uh, i sat down here and i said you know what let me get all these uh computers and such figured out and and let me get everything the way i want it to be so so what better way than to break everything in with a live good morning in new zealand man that is some faraway places <laughs> see i try to do them at different times i'm glad i'm getting some of you guys that i don't normally get 14 month old working line German Shepherd as soon as we hit the sidewalk in front of our house or at the park or at my aunt's huge farm he goes into prey mode your dog goes into prey mode because he is looking for arousal and enrichment in places that he shouldn't be looking right so a lot of dogs um, if you don't give them something to do they're going to find something to do and he has quickly determined that you know smelling prey objects or prey prey animals as you say here um is something that's uh, very entertaining maybe he gets to look at a squirrel run or he can startle a bunny or something like that that can be exciting maybe he'll run across a cat or another dog um and he's learned that uh, this is an extremely exciting and and uh, valuable thing for him to do so what you need to do is number one you need to discourage that behavior you need to make that behavior uncomfortable you need to implement a strong loose leash in your walk and the other thing you need to do is establish a strong structured play relationship with your dog your dog shouldn't be perceiving that there is value outside of your relationship right whenever i see dogs like this the dogs are walking around um you know they're they're they look at literally everything except the handler they're focused on everything except the handler because once they leave the house, the handler is the least important thing in their life. And they have been taught this from day one. I'm sure the handler didn't mean to teach them this, but I've seen this time and time again, as they learn that the handler is the least exciting thing. I see that guy or that girl all the time. The most exciting thing are all the people and dogs and smells and animals and whatever else it is that he or she is gonna run into on the walk. And um, that's just something that you've accidentally taught your dog. So, you need to reverse that. And the way that you reverse that, by the way, um, is again, to reiterate, loose leash walking, which creates real handler engagement, not um, engagement based on bribery, which is what most people call engagement. Look at me and I'll give you a cookie. That's not real engagement, that's just bribery. Um, now, if you do happen to look on me, if you, now, it's not that I don't use treats to train the dogs. Um, if the dog happens to begin seeking engagement with me, I might reinforce the dog. Um, but 
that doesn't mean that I'm bribing the dog and him looking at me is contingent on the cookie because I guarantee he's going to look at me with or without the cookie. All right, let's see what else we got going on. Michelle says, good time for the Aussies. Well, that's good. I know there's a bunch of you guys in Australia. Steel is doing well. Hopefully, we'll be finding him a new placement soon. That's great to hear, Michelle. Steel, uh, if I remember correctly, is a German Shepherd that Michelle adopted with a bite history, and she's been working on rehabbing him. Great to hear. Um, and she's in our online courses, in case you guys were wondering why I would mention it. I have a eight-month-old Malwa, very driven, smart with commands and anything I teach. I don't know how to teach control when she's too rough with other dogs and bites very hard on them. Why are you allowing your eight-month-old Malwa to self-satisfy with other dogs? This comes down to the same problem that, problem that the other person is talking about. You're allowing your dog to self-satisfy in the environment. You're allowing the dog to self-satisfy with interactions that are non-productive. I mean, if the dogs live with her, it's one thing. Then, you know, you need to establish some order in your home. But if it's just strange dogs and you're taking your dog to play with strange dogs and you're wondering why she's rough, you've got an eight-month-old Malwa. There's not much else to say there. If you have real control on the dog, you can say to the dog, easy. And if the dog isn't easy, you can correct the dog. And the dog learns really quickly, hey, I need to be cautious when I hear that verbal cue and I need to calm down. Um, let's see here. Two-year-old female Malwa is dog reactive in the neighborhood only. Good at parks, not dog park stores. Have you ever had that issue? Sure. There's dogs that are selectively reactive in certain areas. You have to understand that um, reactivity can come from a number of places, but, uh, you know, fear and insecurity is certainly one of those places. So, you know, there's something about the experience that your dog has walking with you in the neighborhood that is an experience that they've that, that he or she finds uh, fearful like it's it's a it's something that makes her insecure and you need to look into what it is that you're doing as a handler um, that is exacerbating that insecurity and uh, that's really the, the most direct answer I can give you in terms of why your dog might be selectively reactive I always hear these things like my dog's reactive here but not here my dog is good here but not here and it's simply what you will allow why are you allowing reactivity in your neighborhood? I wouldn't. I wouldn't allow reactivity anywhere. And there wouldn't be, oh, my dog's good here versus my dog is good there. A lot of people give their dog so many choices. And of course, the dog inevitably makes poor choices. So it's important as a handler to say, the rules are consistent. I'm going to hold you accountable. I'm going to do whatever it takes to make this behavior stop. I'm going to follow up with you. I don't care where we are or what we're doing. These are the rules. No means no. Stop means stop. And you know you need to pay attention to me as well as it fault, not only just follow my direction, but engage with me, engage with the handler you know structured play a dog that perceives that you have you control their access to everything when you train a dog properly you know it's not a bribery based relationship nor is it exclusively a coercion based relationship though for sure there should be some element of um you know aversive control where there is a consequence if the dog doesn't listen but a dog a, a relationship exclusively based on that is not productive either you want a balanced relationship the same as you would have with your children i would hope right with your children you want to reinforce good behavior right you want to uh, you know of course make it good to be good but you also want there to be consequences for bad behavior so they don't grow up to be psychopaths right so just as with with the way we raise children we raise dogs now of course the, the the way that we discipline children and dogs depending on the age can be somewhat different but the fundamental principles are the same so if you're a good parent you know you should know what I'm speaking about and if you're not a parent yet or maybe you're not a good parent um, then maybe there's some confusion but at the end of the day it's really simple I make it good I reinforce good behavior with praise with, with food, with play. I give my dog outlets. These are things that you can do that are going to allow you to be all you can be, all right? I'm gonna play rough tug with you. I'm gonna play fetch with you. We're gonna go for off-leash walks. You're gonna get to run. You're gonna get to do all these things. You know, I've got working breeds, so I do things like protection training and so on and so forth. I do competition training with them. They are bred to do this. I am allowing them to express every genetic chromosome they have within them in a productive manner 
but there are rules and there are contact contexts where these behaviors are not allowed and as long as i am giving the dog an outlet i'm stimulating the dog and i'm also giving the dog information of what is and is not allowed i have no problem making it very clear when something is not allowed and that does involve physical corrections dogs are physical non-verbal communicators i communicate with them as such that's that's why i'm good at dog training because they understand me all right let's see here what else we got how can i socialize a pet without them being too friendly that might get stolen your dog's level of sociability barring some really bad things happening has been set in stone your dog's going to be born um your dog's already been born with the level of sociability he or she um, is going to have or not have. Um, a lot of people try to influence this. They think if they make their dog meet lots of people, lots of other dogs are going to make their dog magically more social or less social if they kind of restrain them from doing that. Um, in most cases, that's not true and that doesn't really make a difference. Um, I'm certainly not advocating for a lack of exposure. Your dog should be exposed to a lot of people and a lot of dogs. Um, again, it doesn't impact sociability, but your dog should not be allowed to freely interact with all those people or those dogs. It doesn't help your dog's overall level of sociability, nor does it hurt it. So, you know, um, if, if, if you've got a dog who's wired to be social, he's going to be social regardless of how many dogs you let him meet or don't let him meet and vice versa. Do I do decoy classes? Yes, I have online training on how to be a decoy um and occasionally i'll do a decoy seminar when is it okay to start asking a dog to drop or give you something in everyday life outside of personal protection training we use leave it for things not to pick up i teach leave it from day one puppies are very prone to picking up things that maybe aren't so good for them then you've got the dogs that for whatever reason decide that they like eating things off the ground that maybe aren't so good for them rocks garbage so on and so forth that is a command that um, i am very firm with and i will hold the dog accountable to very quickly because it's a question of life and death in many cases so if the dog is um, you know picking up things leave it firm correction on the leash um, if necessary with a puppy i'll go and and, and scrap scruff him and make him quite uncomfortable if i say leave it and he doesn't leave it i have to reinforce that very very quickly uh, let's see here sorry guys i ended up getting scooched down here and i'm missing a bunch of these things there's a lot of questions here Two-year-old German Shepherd resource guarding the food bowl. How to stop otherwise well-behaved dog? Try everything. Could think of been like this six, six month old. Yes. So um, resource guarding behavior is very common in a lot of dogs. Uh, it is, I shouldn't say very common, but it is. It is an issue that we see quite often. Um, it is there is genetic aspects to that behavior. So it's not like you said, six months old, right? Um, you see this generally very early as a puppy. There are things that you shouldn't do and there are things that you can do to make the behavior less and to also not make the behavior more. So one thing that people do that makes the behavior worse is they constantly mess with the dog's food, right? They constantly try to, to make the dog not worry about them by doing the very thing that the dog is worried about, which is messing with his food, taking it away, giving it back, all that type of stuff. These are not the things that um, you should be doing with resource guarding. With resource guarding, the first thing to do is deconflict the situation. You want to set the dog up with the food. Um, and the first few days, what I'll do with a resource guarding case is I'll just give him his food and I'll let him eat it, right? Like put the food down, leave him alone. And, you know, usually with resource guarders, they're actually quite intense about eating. They're done their food in a couple of minutes. And I just leave them alone for the first little bit. Then what I'll start doing is I'll start approaching the food bowl and as I approach the dog when he's eating well before I get within his little bubble that he doesn't like me in, I'm going to mark and I'm going to throw a nice piece of food or something kind of at the bowl. I probably won't get it in the bowl because I'm not a very good you know, shot with that, but it'll land near the bowl and then usually the dog will be like, ooh, what's that? And they'll go eat it and then they'll go back and eat the bowl. And I'll do this a whole bunch of times until I can work my way in slowly and the dog's very 
um, calm about me approaching because now he anticipates that I'm approaching to add things to the bowl. The other thing that I'll do is um, I will reduce the amount of food in the bowl so that the dog finishes very quickly. And then I will approach the bowl with more food and drop the food in the bowl and then walk away and then repeat this process over and over again. And then the dog learns that me approaching the food bowl is always good. I'm always adding. I'm not taking away. And then, you know, I'm going to fully obedience train the dog the way that I train the dog. Again, if you want to know how I do that, I got plenty of online courses, shieldk9online.com. It'll show you how I train all the behaviors. Once I have the dog fairly well trained, I'm going to give the dog a sit command while he's eating. I'm going to reinforce that sit with the leash. Once he's sitting, I'll give him permission to eat again. I'll do that a bunch of times. Then I'll tell him to sit. Then I'll call him or maybe I'll send him to his place, which is a bed for those of you wondering. And I'll do this until I have a lot of control around the food and he understands that he must listen to me around the food. So I've deconflicted him by approaching the food and reinforcing him while he's eating. Um, by adding more and then I'm also showing him that I can control him around the food and that you know he must basically leave the food when I tell him to leave the food but I don't make it about the food I make it about the obedience if that makes sense to you and from there the problem is usually gone three-year-old German Shepherd wants to play but keeps far enough away that you can get the toy whichever one well, we just recently did a uh, power obedience seminar and many handlers had the same problem where the dog doesn't want to engage with them in the toy. Um, and the reason why your dog doesn't want to engage with you in the toy is because he perceives that the toy by itself is more valuable than the toy and you together. You need to change that perception that he has. You need to make you and the toy together a lot more reinforcing than the toy by itself. How can you make a toy more fun? Well. The shortest answer is tug, right? You can play tug with him in a way that he finds exciting, enjoyable, and entertaining. Again, I go into this in my online courses. Um, you know, you can play fetch with him. You can do a whole bunch of things with the toy that he learns. The toy and you together are way better than the toy just by itself. Needless to say, in the beginning when you play with your dog, you should put your dog on a leash so you can make sure that your dog actually comes back to you instead of a lot playing kind of like this game of um, touch butt with your dog, which in and of itself can be fun for the dog, even if it's not fun for you. Thanks for the great videos. I live in Europe where e-collars are forbidden. Are prong collars just as effective or do you have to adjust a little? I'm thinking especially about fear-based. I'm, I'm not sure about the last part, Jonas, um, of what you said there. Uh, my thing is, so with what you said, sorry guys, I'm just going to expand. No, nope, I'm going to leave that chat the way it is. Um, so with what you said there, uh, prong collars and e-collars are you know very similar devices think of the the e-collar as wireless and the prong collar is kind of like this old-fashioned kind of analog thing i use prong collars a lot in my trading uh but they require a leash attached to them in order to be effective um the great thing about e-collars needless to say is it's wireless and um even though the training principles are the same with both the pinch collar and the e-collar of course the dogs do perceive them somewhat differently um you, you would use them pretty much the same way. So, um, you know, if I had to pick one tool, of course, I would pick the e-collar. Um, at the end of the day, though, uh, you know, when we're speaking about behavior training, which is what it looks like you're talking about, because it, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing here it says um, fear-based aggression. So the solution to behavioral problems are not devices. Devices can amplify the trainer's ability. They can help you get where you want to go um, in a clear and effective manner because what they are is they streamline communication and um, in some cases they can keep you or, or the people that and or animals that the dog is a danger too safe. Um, so I'm a big, obviously, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, of devices when properly used. But we can't say, a dog has fear aggression. Should I use the e-collar or the prong collar? It's like, what? How? Like, there are so many ways to use both those devices. Um, you know, I wouldn't say the magic solution to either of those, to that problem is either of those devices. It's good training. And, you know, for that type of problem, to be honest, you don't really need an e-collar or a prong collar. Um, you know, 
but you can certainly use a prong collar, absolutely. You know, if, if that's what you're able to use, then use it. You can use a choke chain. You can use a slip lead. There are a lot of things that are available to you if you can't or don't want to use an e-collar. I love your work. I appreciate that, Emma. Thank you very much. Um, let me see here. Hello from Germany. I love your way of training, but unfortunately not legal in Germany. The book is very good. I bought it. I appreciate that, Robin. For those of you that don't know, shameless plug. I have a book out. You can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it off my website. No nonsense dog training. It is cheaper if you buy it off my website. No nonsense dog training. A guide to fully train your dog. It is the cheapest way to get access to most of my training um, for pennies on the dollar basically so um and i didn't hold anything back in the book now i know in germany uh and in other places in western europe basically anything that causes discomfort to the dog is illegal um of course it's it's an extremely ridiculous law that makes no sense and there's no grounding of that law in any kind of logic or reason that would stand up to any kind of cross-examination scientific philosophical or otherwise this is not how our society works this is not how nature works there is a reason that we are able to feel discomfort there's a reason that animals are able to feel discomfort it's so that we can learn about the environment around us it's so that we can learn what is good for us and what is bad for us just the same way the reason we feel pleasure is the same reason that we feel discomfort right it's different sides of the same coin um you know there are it's, it's, it's a biological trait that all living creatures have in order to increase our chances of survival and procreation, so on and so forth. And the idea that you're going to create a training system that reliably trains any kind of dog without the use of discomfort in any capacity is asinine, to say the least. But that's Germany for you. Okay. I just got an 18 month old red healer. Is he too old to train? No, he's not too old to train. Um, took in a German Shepherd after a house fire. I saved her from. Does not appear to be fear based. Can I fix it and work and train her? Because she is reactive. Of course you can. There's no like, I can't. Right? Like in, in the majority of cases with behavioral problem, for sure you can. Jonas asks, in your opinion, is there any chance to compete in IGP on a decent level with a small Preza from proper proven working lines? Anything is possible, Jonas, but if you're talking about on a decent level, no. You're, you know, for sure you will get your uh, titles. Um, if you want to talk about a decent level, as in like being in the nationals or something like this, you're competing against herding dogs. You're competing against Mallies and German Shepherds. Um, and most of them are probably using all the tools in the toolbox, so to speak. So, no, you're, you with a Preza is very unlikely. All right. Let's see here. Do I have courses not for puppies? Of course. The Elite Off-Leash Obedience course is the course I have that will literally train any dog, six months and older, um, shieldk9online.com. Here, I'll put it in the chat so you guys know the website. I got all the course. I got a course literally for everything. So if you want a course, just go and check that website out. You'll see something that's for you. Uh, does your book cover step-by-step -step resource guarding and e-call or recall? Uh, yes, it does. Why does my cockapoo follow me everywhere I go? Also, he sleeps by my head at night and lays on top of the couch when I'm sitting on it. Is this a show of dominance or is he being protective? It is neither. Your dog derives great level of security from being close to you. Dogs are naturally social creatures. Obviously, some are more than others. And um, your dog enjoys being close to you and he enjoys the feeling that he gets from that, that safe, warm, secure feeling. Um, now, this can manifest, unfortunately, on the other end as uh, separation anxiety. I'm not saying that your dog has that. I'm saying that the other extreme of this is separation anxiety where the dog is, uh, you know, I shouldn't say the other extreme, but this is where this can go, right, is, is where the dog simply can't tolerate being without you. So that's something to keep in mind. 
Let's see here. I saw a training session with a 10 week old German Shepherd puppy doing heel work and they were using choke chain collar to correct the dog. FYI, they were not using food or toys. Thoughts, cruel or do you agree? I do not agree, Anthony. And I'll tell you why I do not agree. I know it's a big surprise to a lot of people because I'm the big bad wolf of dog training, it seems. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know why anyone would think that would be an appropriate thing to do. Um, a German Shepherd, a puppy that's 10 weeks old of any breed is basically the equivalent of a human toddler, okay? Um, they do not have the cognition, they do not have the maturity, um, and they certainly don't have the physical maturity to be able to handle that kind of training. Um, in this age, I'm more management based. I will train them positively with food, most things. For sure, I will correct them in some ways, but I don't use devices on puppies for the most part. There are very few and far between exceptions where I will use it, especially something like a heel. Heel requires a lot of concentration. So even for an adult dog, it's something that requires significant levels of concentration. It is not an easy command for a dog to learn. Um, and then you're going to basically use compulsion to teach a, a puppy how to heal, right? It's kind of like forcing my, my, my you know, three-year-old son to do mathematics, like calculus, and, and then uh, physically disciplining him when he gets things wrong. Could it be done? To some degree, I'm sure you can do it. Is it the right thing to do? I don't think so. What age can I bring my dog for the elite off-leash obedience training? If you're talking about online training, you can start at six months. If you're talking about in-person training, you can also start at six months. For those of you wondering, we have three locations. We have Toronto, we have Guelph slash Hamilton, and then we also have Woodstock, which is close to London, Ontario. So if you want in-person training, we got those three options for you. What age can I bring my dog? Oh, sorry, that was a repeat. Hello from the Philippines. Is the online decoy training you mentioned on your website? Yes, it is, sir. It's called Protection Foundations. There is a good topic. This is from Michelle. This man stopper dog topic. Seen a rise in it again. Used to be popular, dropped off. Now it seems to be making a comeback. Yeah, I guess people want to talk about man stopper dogs a lot and what that is and what that is not. Man stopper dogs are individuals. You know, people try to classify them as breeds. I saw some trainer on some podcast going on and on about Kenna Corsos and stuff like this. It's like, are you kidding me, Kenna Corsos? 99% of Kenna Corsos couldn't fight their way out of a wet paper bag. I don't know what kind of man you think they're going to be stopping, you know? And it's the same with the vast majority of these man stopper breeds. Um, you know, it's individuals that we look for when we use the word man stopper. There are special individuals. Of course, they are more predisposed to be within certain breeds. Breeds like the German Shepherd, the Dutchie, the Malinois. Um, you know, some of the Mastiffs, you'll see these. Some Pressas, so on and so forth. Some Borbles. Um, you know, Pit Bulls, you'll find some in that they can fall into that category. But it's individuals within the breed. Um, it's not like a breed full stop. Uh, most dogs of every breed I don't care what they're originally bred to do, they're not going to be in that classification of man stopper. But there are always a few special individuals. I want you to think of it like, if you guys have heard the term the Predo distribution, right? It's this bell curve that everything exists on. So we have, if you want to think of it in an easy way, right? On the, the lowest end of the curve, we kind of have like the the weakest, the the least, you know, the, the, the less, the least intelligent, the least strong, okay? And then in the middle, you kind of have your average and, and then you have below average and above average. And then on the, the far extreme end of that Pareto distribution, you have, you know, the smartest, the strongest, the fastest, whatever thing you're measuring, Man stopper is at that extreme end, and it's simply impossible that there would be many individuals that would fall within that category. Um, but you know, I've met 60 pound man stoppers, and I've met 150 pound man stoppers. Um, the size of the dog, the breed of the dog, um, are largely irrelevant, of course, within reason. Like, you're not going to ask me about a husky that's a man stopper. I'm sorry, you know. Let's see what else we got here. My German Shepherd 
Got your book, loving it so far. Um, Hi, Has, can you point out the differences between body language and barks with prey drive and defense? I've heard barks are different when a dog is in prey or defense. Yes, I can. So, prey is an acquisition behavior. It is a predatory behavior. That's literally what it is. It is the desire to, per well, originally, it's the, the urge, the desire to hunt, pursue, pounce, bite, and ultimately consume, um, you know, other living things. Um, and obviously, dogs, to some degree, have this drive or some version of this drive. Now, of course, we've taken that drive and we've twisted it to meet our needs as human beings. So there's a lot of dogs that have, you know, um, we've taken that prey drive and, and put it towards objects, right? So. Um, you know, we've, we've selected and purposely bred dogs that have placed a, a really high value on something like a small rubber ball or, or a, a jute tug or something like that. And the dog has such a high desire and, and a high level of, of motivation to seek out, pursue and grab and, and hold on to this object that we can now use that desire to uh, motivate the dog to do things like find drugs, do competition obedience, so on and so forth. Um, so prey is an acquisition behavior. Defense is ultimately based in fear. I know there's a lot of people that like to kind of make defense out to be this, you know, wonderful thing and protection. And you'll hear people people say like, I was recently talking to a guy because um, he told me he had some dogs for sale, and he's like, I started him in defense, uh, and he said it like, I don't start in prey, I only start in defense. He was talking about a puppy, and I, I just stopped talking to him because I'm like, okay, this guy's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about, right? Um, defense is is a drive that a dog has to protect him or herself, right? Ultimately, he perceives a threat and he's reacting to that threat with a behavior designed to drive the threat away. So the barking, obviously, is significantly different because the emotions behind both those things are different. So again, prey is an acquisition behavior. So dog that is in prey actually tend not to bark as much. If they're really high in prey, a lot of the time they won't even bark um, if they're prey locked. They'll kind of be like super intense. Their eyes will be bugging out of their head and they'll be pulling and they'll be making kind of like a ah, noise because you know usually the collar, the, the harness is, is restricting their breathing because they're pulling that hard. Um, or if they're barking, it's more of a high-pitched bark. Um, you know, but it's it's a rapid bark, right? Hut, 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 right? That's a prey bark. Sometimes there'll be a little bit of a scream to it, like, ah, you know, and but they'll be really intense, really forward. Defense, right? Like in its purest form, you're going to hear very kind of like, hoo, 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 hoo. and usually you'll see the dog backing up, ears will be back, you know, a lot of teeth. You'll see a lot of teeth being shown by the dog uh, because it's a display. It is a bluff behavior. It's get the hell away from me. I don't. I think you're going to kill me. I think you're going to hurt me. I perceive you to be a threat. Get away. So prey, fast, rapid, active. Right. Sometimes depends on the dog. Some of them are a little screamy, like ah! right or hut 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 hut. And then again, the defense is woo, 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 And it's always kind of like, get away. Okay, let's see what else we got. Are there Malinois that are more defensive drive? Well, there are Malinois that are nerve bags, if that's what you're asking, and they perceive a threat everywhere. People think defense is good like again there's this so like any kind of trainer that really trains dogs for real world applications and has a lot of dogs behind them and you know like they they do training for law enforcement you know they they do a lot of things on the field of competition they don't exist in the halls of 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 the internet trainer um you know uh, the, the the internet trainer where people talk for hours on forums about defense and blah 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 the people that really train dogs for a living and 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 train them to a high level and to a high standard don't say things like this right um, defense is a drive but it's generally not considered um, an overly uh, valuable drive in most dogs especially any kind of dog that we're going to be 
wanting to do offensive type work. Um, I don't mind some defense in my protection dogs because ultimately, you know, it makes them a little bit more suspicious and a little more prone to, you know, alerting to, you know, somebody coming on the property, for instance, or somebody that's acting a little sketchy or suspect. Um, but that being said, any excessive amount of defensive driving a dog almost always, you know, will impede the bite work if you're looking to take the bite work to take that real protection work to a high level. Um, because again, it's it's a drive that is fear and fear is avoidance, right? So I know there's all these people they want to talk. Most of the time when I see some trainer talking about he trains in defense, I see him with a prey with a prey frustration dog on a back tie. And he's got a whip out and he dropped his sleeve on the ground and he's hitting the dog with the whip and he's saying, look, he's in defense because I dropped my sleeve. And there's no way he could be in prey if I don't have my sleeve on my arm. And I mean, that's the level of in intelligence you see with most people that speak like that. Um, but yeah. So are there Malwa that are more defensive? For sure there are. Is it a good trait for a Malwa to have? Hell no. Give me prey, frustration dog any day of the week. I don't mind a touch of nerve as long as the nerve is overpowered by, um, you know, a really strong drive and good environmentals. What is it about Rottweilers that make you not want to own them? Well, again, with Rotties, I like Rotties. Um, a lot of them carry a ton of dog aggression. Uh, the males uh, are not for the faint of heart. I am in the business of selling dogs to people. And um, the average person could not handle, the average person I sell a dog to could not handle, nor would they want to handle a male Rottweiler um, that I would consider to be a strong dog. Um, and you know, there's, they tend to have, like I said, it's harder to find good Rottweilers than German Shepherds. So it's not that I don't like them. It's just that I have to be realistic about who my clientele are. And, um, you know, I also have to be realistic about what their capabilities are and what they want in a dog. These guys want to, you know, they want to take their dog to Starbucks with them. They want their dog to, to ride in the, in the, in the front seat of their Porsche and, and all this type of stuff. They don't want to be worried that their dog's going to go and you know, smoke some lady's golden doodle, you know, at, at the local Starbucks. It's just not, it's just not something that they want to deal with. They don't want a dog that, you know, is going to challenge them constantly for, for, you know, um, you know, leadership and, and, uh, you know, <clears throat> you know, give them a whole bunch of grief over, you know, things that, you know, the strong male Rottweiler might give an inexperienced handler grief over. So that's, that's a, that's a quick thought on that. Any thoughts on proposed California bill to remove and ban police canines? Well, that's California for you, right? I'm sure the police canines are racist. I'm glad they have time to do that. I mean, from what I hear and what I see from California, it looks like the place has turned into a third world you-know-what hole. Um, crimes through the roof, drug addictions, uh, homelessness. I, I mean, I'll be selling a lot of dogs there. Not to the police, but I'll be selling a lot of dogs there to... Um, concerned citizens that for whatever reason haven't found a way to move out of that that cesspit it's a pity because it's a beautiful uh, state but you know um it's it's not a safe place and it's becoming progressively unsafe more unsafe you know this idea that you know by removing police canines you're somehow going to be doing a favor to you know people in minority communities it's it's asinine it's the same idea that says oh we we need to reduce police presence in minority communities because that's racist right it's like no i want a lot of cops around where i live i don't mind there being a lot of cops because if there's a lot of cops there's there's less crime um you know and the police dogs exist for a reason um you know they 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 really expedite the job of of, of law enforcement and they're actually they actually probably save a lot of lives because scenarios that may have devolved into deadly force scenarios right where a gun is drawn or even something like a taser is used you know instead they're resolving that with a canine right canines have not only saved police officers lives they've saved countless um, civilian lives so i mean it's it's the whole thing is asinine but california is an asinine place and it's run by asinine people and there's enough people in that state that vote for these people. So, I mean, it's no great surprise. And, you know, I'm sure they will be banned there. All right. Let's see here. 
Opinion on Larry Crone style of e-collar prep on low levels first. I prep my dog a lot on low levels. Um, you know, that's certainly not something that is, uh, like, if you train in my system, I use a lot of low stim conditioning. Um, it's, it's a good way to train a dog. It's a smart way to train a dog. Um, you know, this, I've said it before and I'll say it again. This idea that low stim conditioning is a bad idea, it, it doesn't make any sense. The people that say low stim conditioning is a bad idea are the same people that use leash. And they use leash pressure to train the dogs. And I guarantee you when they, in fact, I know, I'm not, I'm not guaranteeing you, I know when they train dogs, when they first get a dog, they're not ripping the dog's head off right and using that leash at a high level they're using that leash in a slow and gradual way and showing the dog what they want with the leash reinforcing that behavior solely the idea that you would train differently with an e-collar to me doesn't make any kind of sense um and i've seen the results of not conditioning properly with an e-collar because believe me not all dogs react the same to an e-collar there are some dogs that really do not react well to um, the e-collar the first time they feel it no matter how low it is so it's important to really have a way to introduce the e-collar to the dog in a way that makes sense love your book and the added links to videos are a great bonus yeah for those of you that don't know my book i have qr codes all throughout my book you literally just put your phone and scan the qr code and it'll shoot you to one of my videos to kind of further explain whatever it is that we talked about in the book Let's see. Who's it? Any tips on teaching a puppy the functional heel simultaneously with the focus heel? I teach those behaviors separately. And again, with puppies, if we're talking a dog below six months, I don't teach them functional healing. I don't like to put pressure on puppies for healing. I just manage the puppy. I, I have a flexi lead on the puppy. I, I'll do some food work and lure them in the position and reinforce them there. But... I don't force them to stay there. I don't think it's something um, that's good for them. Um, what do you think about switching from a sleeve to a toy in competition protection? In competition, what do you mean a sleeve to a toy? Oh, like the decoy would have a toy? I don't think it's good. I don't think it's good. Why would you do that? Can dogs forget the e-collar, the final stages of the training when it's rarely used except for extreme distraction? Should I go back to conditioning sometimes just in case? Dogs can't forget the e-collar if you've trained it properly. Um, what can happen is you could think that you trained it properly and then all of a sudden, you know, your dog's showing you that you haven't and you, you know, you might say, well, he must have forgot. I don't think he ever knew. I've never seen a dog that I, and I get dogs in here all the time we trained them a year or two ago and the owners are going on a trip or whatever and they say, oh, you know, he's not listening anymore. Bring him back to Shield Canine and they'll they'll tune him up, which is a service we offer, by the way. Um, and um, in within 10 minutes of handling the dog, all of a sudden he magically knows all the things that he supposedly forgot. So they don't forget if they're properly trained. Um, in many cases, people rush the training or they skip steps or they're not so clear in their communication and... You know, they think maybe the dog knows when the dog doesn't. Um, and, uh, of course, there you can see some problems. Are your online courses suitable for a first-time dog owner, beginner to master obedience and hopes to later get into more advanced work? For sure. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's... Uh, it's one of those uh, it's one of those things where you know the more you know the better you know I'd like to think my online course um, is probably one of the most simple and effective courses out there for the money um, you'll certainly have a well-trained dog by the end of it uh, do you do BH evaluations I mean do you mean can you book a session with me bring your dog and ask me if you're ready to do a BH if that is your question the answer is yes do I breed Malinois for bite work? Planning on doing PSA. Right now I don't, but I could in the future. You know, when I get a, when I get a hold of a nice female, I like to keep them for a few breedings. What do you think about switching? Okay, I sorry, I read that one again. Could you talk a little bit about how you started working with dogs and eventually managed to monetize it into a successful business? What would you do differently now that you can look back? Um, I mean, I didn't have it in my mind to monetize it. It was a hobby for me. 
I had a German Shepherd. Um, you know, I started getting interested in dog sport. I was interested in learning how dogs learn and think. And I was interested in behavior modification. Um, I found that stuff super interesting. And, um, you know, I was, it was just a hobby. I studied it for a long time. Um, I experimented with a lot of different dogs and training it. And, you know, I just did what I could do to get my hands on as many dogs as I could get them on. I never had it in my mind that I was going to train dogs for a living. And then one day I said, well, you know, I would like to get my hand on more dogs than what I can organically do right now. Why don't I set up a little side business, maybe helping people with some training. I won't charge a lot of money and I'll just help people on the side and uh, I'll get to train more dogs and it'll be fun for me. And, uh, you know, I started doing that and within a couple years that had turned into what is now Shield Canine because it turns out I guess I'm pretty good at dog training. Uh, let's see here. How do I fade rewards to the dog such as food? What do you mean fade rewards? In terms of like just in regular everyday life? Oh, my, be my, my dog's behaving in everyday life is not contingent on rewards. They understand that they must listen to me. That being said, I'll variably reinforce good behavior for the duration of the dog's life, um, whether that's giving the dog a piece of food, playing with the dog, or giving the dog freedom. When you have an awfully strained dog, a new tool in the toolkit, so to speak, is the ability to say to your dog, free, and your dog then gets to run away from you and play and smell and do what he wants to do. And then you can call him back and he comes back. And now all of a sudden, you have the ability to reward your dog by giving them access to the environment instead of just a liver treat or, um, you know, a, a, a tug or whatever. Something that the uh, positive trainers, unfortunately, are not able to do. How do you feel about Dobermans and their workability? Um, well, it's generally quite poor. Can you find good ones? Sure, very hard to find though. Let's see here. My German Shepherd is more defensive than prey. Would he do well in the sport? Well, Roderick, it would really depend on, you know, I can't say because I don't know your dog. I've, you know, seen a lot of things where people say a dog is a certain way and then I see the dog and evaluate him and he's not that way. Um, but no, in sport, you know, the dogs that are the most successful are the dogs that have a lot of prey drive. Um, you know, excessive nerves, which is what defense is, is not super productive in, you know, any kind of sport, uh, any kind of bite sport where the dog needs to go and engage, not just be reactive towards the helper. Um, when dealing with a handler aggressive dog, is it better to address that behavior first before doing e collar obedience? I would do this. I do it simultaneously. I mean, again, e collar is just something I layer into the obedience training, um, you know. But it's certainly not what I would do to fix handler aggression. Like handler aggression is is a different thing altogether. Usually, when I hear that a dog's handler aggressive and we begin training the dog. Um, just through the training process, I'll run into that handler aggression, I'll run into that protest behavior, which is what in many cases handler aggression is. It's either an unconscious kind of redirection of frustration and, um, you know, drive, or it's uh, a learned behavior that the dog has come up with in order to escape doing things that he doesn't want to do. In either case, um, the solution is not the electric collar. The solution is actually something else um, or some other things. But either way, we make that behavior very um, not good for the dog. And needless to say, they quickly stop doing it. Um, but the e-collar is not how I stop that behavior. How do I feel about the creation of the King German Shepherd? There's no such thing. I mean, there are people that are mixed breeding dogs or people that are selecting only large dogs to breed together. I mean, I can breed a, breed some German Shepherds together and call them something stupid like, you know, has Shepherds. It doesn't make it a thing, you know, other than, I guess, if enough people buy into it. So I don't really feel one way or the other about it. Do you think Gage would come back to you? 
if you would have sold him, oh, for sure, he would have come back to me. He would have bit several people, and then he would have come back. <laughs> how, do you conf how do you remove conflict around the ball with a dog that has crazy ball drive? I teach him to play with me. I teach him some basic manners around the ball. Um, and uh, I teach him that it's in his best interest to cooperate with me and the ball. My dog is booked for a board and train in May. Would he be able to get an assessment done to determine if he would be a protection prospect? Uh, as long as it's uh, you know not a behavior case. Generally, for any kind of behavior case, we are not doing protection training. We don't recommend it for those types of dogs. Um, but if it's not a behavior case and if it's an appropriate breed for the work, again, I'm not like if you got a lab, I'm not doing it, right? Um, then yeah, we can take a look and, and we can see. What is the best way to start a career in dog training, gain hands on experience without owning a dog? Well, you must own a dog, I think, in order to be a, um, in order to, uh, be a dog trainer. I don't know how you could offer the service to help someone with their dog if you never even owned a dog. For me, that's that's just not a possibility. Um, you have to own a dog, and you have to find a, a situation where you can get multiple hands on a dog, and um, you know actually train said dogs. Let's see here. How do you train a dog to not get flat after ten minutes? Um, if you're talking about in terms of my competition obedience, which I would assume since you're using the term flat, I make the dog active towards me. I make the dog active towards me and my dog doesn't work for my ball, for the ball exclusively. He finds a deep intrinsic joy within the behavior, such as like the focus healing, stuff like this. Um, and he enjoys the work with me. So it's not just about the ball and it's not just about, like when I use an e-collar on my dog in, um, you know, the healing, it's not to prevent my dog from running away. The e-collar, I'm actually fine tuning things with the e-collar. So like, let's say he's a little bit in front of me in the healing, I'll fix that with the e-collar. Let's say his rear end's a little bit behind me. I'll fix that with the e-collar. Let's say I want him a little more active. I'll make him a little more active with the e-collar. The e-collar is not to actually keep my dog with me. Most people, when they use the e-collar in um, sport training, the, the e-collar is actually to keep the dog with them. The dog would leave them if he had the choice. My dog will not leave me if he has the choice because for him, there's nothing he can think of that's more exciting than me and the ball together. He grabs his ball, he hammers me with his ball, and he just, just possesses the ball with me and really enjoys the interaction that we have you know, over the ball, right? So... Um, at the end of the day, you have to say, why is my dog doing what he does? Is he doing what he does because I have a ball in my armpit? Is he doing what he does because I have an e-collar on him? Or does he doing what he, what he does because he truly, truly enjoys this, right? Um, and if the answer is anything less than the last thing, um, then you're probably, that's the answer to your question, why your dog would become flat, right? Uh, let's see here. I'm having trouble getting my dog to stay on place. Any advice for me? Yes, you must correct your dog if he comes off place. And you must increase the level of correction until the dog is, understands that he must remain on the bed. Let's see here what else we've got. Does your YouTube account have complete basic obedience videos? I have a lot of videos for free on my YouTube account that for sure will help first-time dog owners. Um, that being said, if you want sequential videos um, that are designed for a first-time dog owner, whether you have a puppy or an adult dog, whether you have a behavior case, whether you're interested in sport training, then there's no better option than my online courses or, at the very least, my book, No Nonsense Dog Training. If you want to check out my online courses, shieldk9online.com. How much bite work should you do in a day and how long and how many times a week just to be safe? Emma, it completely depends on your goal, depends on your dog. Personally, for me, I don't do bite work with my personal dogs more than three, four times a week. Let's see. E. Petroka says, hey guys, I work with Haz directly with our Doberman Raja. If you're having issues with yours, buy his course and do the work. Our dog is now fully off-leash and dependable. 
Thank you, Mr. Petroka. I'm glad that we were able to help you, and I hope Raja is doing well. How can I learn e-collar trading? You can get my online course or you can read my book. It's full step-by-step. -step. It's definitely not something I could tell you even in an hour, right? But there's step-by-step -step process and you know you need to implement that process with your dog or even a number of dogs and then you'll learn how to train with an e-collar. It's actually not that complicated. Improve three-quarter grip to full. So what he's saying is when the dog bites, he's three-quarters and he would like the dog to be full. Usually I'm gonna find some way to negatively punish that grip um, so I'll usually use leather, bite, uh, bite pillows or something like that that get slippery when they're wet. The dog will bite three quarter. I'll start to work it out of the dog's mouth. The dog will fill his mouth up all the way. And then I'll reinforce that by leaving him alone with the toy and reinforcing that behavior. The toy, the pillow, I should say. And I just do this over and over again until the dog learns. If he's like this, he should be like this. He needs to feel the the, the, the toy or the, uh, the bite object against the back of his mouth, not on his canines. Somebody says here, Hillary, thanks for the great weekend seminar. I learned so much and really appreciate the feedback. Fired up and excited, putting the work in. I'm happy you're happy, Hillary. It was nice to see you and to see your dog. She's talking about the Power Obedience Seminar we just had. Um, it was a good time. We had a lot of good handlers, a lot of interesting um, cases to work with. And um, I think we really did uh, some good work with a lot of the dogs. A lot of uh, dogs there and wanted to work on the healing. And there's nothing I like more than strong, powerful healing. Let's see here. Eves, let's work when I visit Ontario this Monday. I'm a young dog trainer from NYC. I've been a longtime fan. Reach out on Insta. I'm bringing my Dolby. You'll find him very fun and workable. Well, Eves, no offense, my friend, but I've got lots of friends and I've got little amount of time. So if you want to book a session, we can talk about it. Again, it would depend on if things line up with what it is I'm doing. But if you just want to hang out and talk dogs, I am not available for that. I got too much too much on the go right now um, though I do appreciate your support how do you react when a dog acts defensively when off leash dogs run up it's not true reactivity so I don't know what to do well um, if you're talking about Nico um, Yesenia uh, I would strongly suggest that you don't put him in that position where strange dogs are running up to him um, I don't think that's good for him or for those dogs um, but I certainly would, if, if I can't avoid it, I'd release the dog and I just let the dog go in front because uh, I don't want to keep the dog in obedience and then have something bad happen in the obedience, but I will release the dog and um, let the interaction occur. If I can control my dog, I'll simply put my dog in a down or whatever and I'll drive the other dog off or grab him and take him back to the owner. Um, and that's certainly my preference. If the other dog's aggressive, I mean... I know you're a little lady, so you know maybe there's not so much you can do. For me, in my case, I'll grab my dog, hold him away from the other dog, and use my boots to keep the other dogs off. Uh, if you're in a situation where that happens a lot, maybe uh, carry a big stick when you're walking and utilize it to keep the other dogs away from him. Um, if it's just you know some friendly random dogs running up and he gets a little hackly and but he doesn't do anything beyond a little whoa, whoa and get away from me, that's fine. If he becomes aggressive or tries to get after them, then for sure I would say no and firmly correct that. How did the seminar go? The seminar was terrible. It was the worst seminar I've ever had. No, I'm kidding. Um, she's talking about, again about the Power Obedience Seminar. Was it possible to film the seminar? We did film the seminar. Uh, we're going to see how the footage turned out and uh, we're going to see if we can uh, put it out on our online training um, channel so that uh, those of you that um, are interested in virtually attending the seminar and seeing me work with all the handlers that were there um, will be able to have access to it, but we'll see. What should puppy, when should puppies begin PPE foundation? I, I, I think you're saying personal protection foundation. Uh, for me, they must have their teeth. I don't really bother unless they have their teeth beyond like just checking the drive of the dog when they're young, see kind of what's there, but that's it. 
I have a rod, six bots. He is a hyper focus on other dogs and pulls hard on the slip lead. Has been sick twice. I have tried treats. Well, treats aren't going to help you, Evan. Um, you know, at the end of the day, your dog's hyper focused on other dogs because he perceives that there's going to be a significant level of reward in, in the interaction with those dogs. And we need to remove that possibility from his little brain. So things like socializing your dog with other puppies and stuff like this only make that worse. Um, you need to get it into your dog's head that he's not going to get to meet those dogs. Um, and furthermore, you know, if he offers unnecess uh, unacceptable levels of arousal or, or, or reactivity towards those dogs, there's going to be a consequence that he won't find enjoyable. And then on top of that, we're going to reinforce behaviors that we do like, such as him paying attention to you and th him performing obedience with you and him playing with you. So that's a short-term answer. Buy my book, Evan. It's, it's like 15 bucks, man. Just buy it. I think it'll help you a lot. Uh, how to train a dog that is consistently barking in the kennel. Um, well, you're not really training him. You want to train him to not bark in the kennel. I would suggest that you do train the dog, of course, in order to... Um, of course, avoid uh, him be being understimulated. Um, but if you have trained the dog, you are stimulating him properly and he is barking in the kennel, then you must correct him for barking in the kennel. You must make it uncomfortable for him every time he barks in the kennel. There are multiple ways to do that. There are devices that you can use for that. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, pretty simple. How do I correct my dog with a prong in front of people? You correct your dog with a prong in front of people. That's how you do it. I mean, Calvin, like at the end of the day, it's your dog. You're responsible for his behavior. If people don't like it, you know, tell them where to go. I just want to say congratulations on your well-deserved success. Thank you very much. Dog trainers often talk about confidence building in a dog. Can you give examples? Uh, yeah, for sure I can. Um, so things like structured play, that builds the confidence of the dog. But you know what really builds the confidence of the dog more than anything else? Taking the dog through his fear. There are many dogs that we see, they come to us for training and they're literally crawling on the ground. You know, they're afraid of everything and they're reacting to everything and they just don't know how to deal with life they don't know how to deal with the stress of life they don't know how to deal with the variability of life they don't know how to deal with social interactions or environmental challenges noises surfaces obstacles everything is just a, a big problem for these dogs and instead of showing the dog how to come through these things and being firm but fair with the dog and saying hey I know the floor is scary, but you're going to walk on the floor today. And I'm not going to use a thousand hot dogs to try and convince you to walk on the floor. You're just going to walk on the floor. And I know that dog over there is making you feel funny, but you're not allowed to bark at him. And, you know, instead of just leaving you hanging, why don't you go and sit on that bed over there? And, you know, uh, instead of keeping you on this six foot leash for the duration of your life, why don't I, you know, teach you how to come when you're called in a reliable and safe manner and then take you for walks in the woods where you can smell the ground and, you know, experience freedom in life in a way that, that dogs are, are meant to experience freedom in life. And why don't I do things like play ball with you and play fetch with you and encourage you to do the things that I need you to do, but also discourage you from doing the things that I don't need to do and give you that constant feedback, guidance and support that a handler or a parent you know, should be giving to their dog and to their child. This is how you raise or keep a dog, make a dog as confident as uh, he or she is going to be. Not bribery, not avoiding things because of the stress, all this type of stuff. You face life head on, you take them through life and you show them how to live. Have you ever took your dog inside Vaughn Mills? He's talking about a big mall. No, I have not. I'm not one of those psychopaths that takes my dog in the mall. I see people do it all the time, man. It's crazy to me. It's like, you know, what if he has diarrhea? What if, what if you know, things aren't going well and, and uh, you know, he, he, he lets something out his rear end. Now everybody at the mall is going to be upset with you. For me, the mall is a place for shopping. It's not a place for dogs. Um... Uh... My dog will not recall 
when next to my girl. When I shock him, he still doesn't come. He lays down next to her as, as she is his safe space. He's fully conditioned to e-call or recall when she's not there. This is from Arams0327. I hope you are not my cousin Aram. Because if you are, I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. Um, <laughs> but listen, man, whether or not you're my cousin, why are you setting your dog up to do things like that? Why are you trying to call your dog off your girl? You know, like at the end of the day, if you recall your dog and he comes to you or your girl, is it such a big deal? Now, if it's a thing where he's like escaping to your girl because he doesn't want to go to you because he doesn't want to do what it is that you're asking him to do, then for sure you must correct him. Put a light on the dog and condition him to come off of her. We certainly see that of what, that commonly here when we train dogs. Some dogs will say, well, you know what? I don't want to go to that trainer that's asking me to do all these things I don't want to do. Instead, let me escape to this random person that I found and I'll go and stick myself to their legs instead of coming when I'm called. And for these dogs, I simply set them up for the problem. I, I put them next to that person that they don't want to leave. I put a line on them and I condition them to come off that person. That's, um, that's, that's it at the end of the day. Any breeds you can think of that might be okay for allergy sufferers that can also succeed at real-world protection work besides giant schnauzer? Um, no. I'm sorry. I do not know. I do not. I, I can't think of one. Or am, am I planning on making a tracking or send detection course? Um, so I am in talks. So look. Um, I, I, I do a lot of IGP tracking. I'll probably make a course for that at some point. Um, in terms of tracking and scent detection, if you're talking about man trailing and scent detection, um, I'm in talks with some individuals that I think are maybe more uh, qualified to bring you guys those courses. And um, I do plan on hosting those courses on my online platform. Um, but I can't give an ETA on that right now. Hello, has Oscars getting better? Oh, Oscars a German Shepherd. Very excited to come back to training next week. Awesome, man. I'm super happy to hear it. And we look forward to seeing you. All right. Okay, guys. What's the reason I don't do bite work three, four times a week? I do do bite work three to four times a week. So there's no reason. Um some it depends on what you're doing and my dogs are not like in a position where they need to have uh you know uh tons and tons of bite work every day so it's not a priority for me what if as a handler i've avoided uncomfortable situations and now after two years if i act confident will my dog's behavior change your dog's behavior change will change if you show your dog what the behavior is you can't just go in there with your head up and and your chest out and, and hope that everything works out well you have to be ready to communicate with your dog whether it's telling him to stop doing something or encouraging him to do something uh, do i ever train preza canarios my friend i've trained many preza canarios and i used to breed them let's see here is your book good for dogs who will eventually be trained for personal protection or some other type of real working field if you're talking about does my book give you functional obedience training and a strong understanding of how dogs learn, think, and communicate? Yes, it does. And yes, it would be. In your, in your book, you talk about loose leash walking and healing. Is it okay to loose leash walk for an entire walk? Sure it is, if you want. Okay, guys. Thank you very much. I think we got to the end of everything. Um... And uh, I appreciate you guys coming on here. And I think I figured out how to work my new setup here. And um, hopefully soon. Hold on. Someone said something here. In the secret sauce, the prong collar seems to make power, drive, compulsion. A bit similar to that theory. How do you do it with using it as an aversive later? Um... The prong collar does not make power, my friend. I think you misunderstood that. Um, but if you're asking how I can active use use um, 
use devices to activate my dog and then also use those same devices to correct a dog later. It's the same with the e-collar, it's the same with anything. Um, I certainly can use them because it's all about intensity and context. Remember, dogs are contextual learners. So if something happens, like for instance, if you correct your dog, if you have a dog and you're doing like bite work, for instance, most dogs, if you correct them during bite work, they're way more resilient to that correction in bite work than they would be in regular life. It's, it's the same as when you're doing this type of training, right? All right, guys. I thank you all for coming on here. Once again, let me mention shieldk9online.com for all my online courses. Uh, I sell all the training gear that I use day-to-day -day in training, prong collars, e-collars, balls, magnets, magnet vests, everything. Shieldk9.ca, check out our products. We have in-person training in Toronto. We have in-person training in Guelph. And we have a facility in Woodstock. So we have three facilities to serve you better and more coming soon, hopefully. Um, I think that's all the things I have to sell you right now. Thanks for watching. And you all have a good time. Or good night, I should say.